Hi, everyone. This is Lonnie from the library, and I'm going to do an encore recorded presentation for how to invest in stocks. This was recorded on June 23rd, 2021. So please keep in mind if the numbers have aged. Uh, I'm Lonnie from the library and I'm a librarian. As a librarian, my job is to algamate information, whether it is the best books for kids, which diet resources to consume, or what financial books to access, and present enough choices so that you become comfortable enough to make informed decisions according to your needs. That's the goal of this workshop today. I'm not associated with any bank. I have no vested interest in anything I talk about today. I merely want to help to ensure the community needs are met. And that's the catharsis of my profession. So we're gonna get into what is money, how to think of it differently, the different accounts you can use uh, when investing in stocks, as well as the investment vehicles. And of course, how you can leverage the library to reach your financial goals. So let's begin. It seems like a denial, benign question, but what is money? Uh, to give some con context, of course, there's the $20 Canadian bill and everyone would point towards, oh, the money in my pocket or the money in my bank account is my money. However, uh, it's a little deeper than that. So in the early 1970s, America got off the gold standard. And what that meant is that all the money was now backed by governments rather than a commodity. And so what's called fiat money. And so there's the Canadian $20 bill and that's essentially debt that the government of Canada owes you. And so when you start thinking about money as debt rather than uh, expenses, then you start to get a real context for how is the relations between things and the social relations between people interact via money. And more to the point about money as, uh, as debt, during the COVID crash, uh, especially it kind of peaked in March 2020, uh, the, world has, the world economies have printed over $10 trillion digitally during the crash. And what has happened, this happened in uh, the Great Depression, this happened during World War I and World War II, is that the banks of the world create lots of money and they buy T-bills or bonds, they create those, and then the rich citizens of the world buy up those bonds, T-bills and what have you, live off interest, and the economies can stay afloat. And so this happened similarly during the COVID crash, just $10 trillion out of thin air. Um, however, what also banks do is because you can go to a bank and ask for a loan, they use what's called fractional lending. Uh, what this entails is if you have, let's say $2,000 in your checking account, they're allowed to a certain point because they have a reserve, they're allowed to loan out your money. Uh, that's what the banks do. And that's how they make their profit. But more importantly, they're allowed to, up to a certain degree, do fractional lending. So they can lend out that same 2,000 to multiple people as long as on their books, they're covered. And so, you can see how banks and uh, pension funds, hedge funds, they understand how money is extremely amalgamable. It can shift, it is fluid. And as such, you as a retail investor, as just a, a, a Canadian citizen or someone living here, uh, you have a right then to start thinking of money in a similar terms. And so I'll get into what that exactly means. So there, there is a lot of fear, generally speaking, that comes from, oh, I'm not sure. I don't want to invest money in the stock market. It, it's very risky. Uh, I can lose money. And some of those ideas can be true in the short term, but over the long term, it's, not, it, it's less likely. Um, but more importantly, let's say, what are some of the alternatives? Some of the alternatives is, as I mentioned before, let's say you just put money you save money and you put it into your savings account. This is not an form of investing. And the specific reason is because when you have money in your savings account, it loses to inflation. Inflation is essentially as a result of, there's more factors than this, but the biggest factor is printing money for production. So during COVID, we printed over $10 trillion in the world economy, uh, more so since uh, this presentation. And this, 
slowly decays the purchasing power of your money. And on average, since uh, the turn of the 20th century, inflation has now averaged to about 2% per year. And certainly the governments of the world, uh, America and Canada being the prime examples, try to aim for inflation to be 2% per year. So what this really means is that your goods and services over time caught, end up costing more, again, about 2% approximately. This is why you get that idea from a grandparent says, back in my day, bread cost 10 cents. And it was true because 10 cents had the purchasing power of $4 today or $5 today for the equivalent bread. And so if you just kept your money in the savings account every year, technically then you're losing 2% of buying power with that money. So you might, and the, the bank's and the savings account might pay you 0.1%. So that's nowhere near inflation. So firstly, uh, you shouldn't think of a savings account as a, a way to invest, but that's really for short-term goals. You're buying something large, let's say a car, or you have some short-term goal, like um, you're paying for a tuition, for example. And to really solidify the decaying, eroding effect of inflation, you can see on the left side of your screen, there's a chart and it's the buying power of $100. This is from StatsCan uh, from 1945, just after World War II, all the way to present. And you can see $100 in 1945 now has approximately the buying power of about $8 equivalent. And that's assuming that that money didn't, uh, wasn't invested in anything. It was just standing in cash. If you look on the right side, you can see something similar where it shows a basket of goods. So if in 2001, I accelerated just in the last 20 years, if you had $100 in 2001, today, that same equivalent uh, purchasing would be, it would cost $143. And so you can see just in 20 years, how the price of, uh, on average, the price of goods has increased by 43%. And so 2% seems insignificant if you take it year by year. But as you grow the compound interest over time, 2% becomes very, very uh, significant especially over our lifetimes as investors and as people of the world. But more importantly, I think, is the reason why you should be investing in some capacity into stocks, bonds, and, and more vehicles we'll get into later, is because you are an investor in the world. And this is what I mean. Uh, you pay taxes, in our case, Canadian taxes, that build the roads, they finance the vehicles, sorry, the, the building of public infrastructure. So I'm thinking Canada Post, the roads, healthcare system, public services, such as our public library. And the corporations of the world, they use these, they use these infrastructures uh, at a discounted rate because some of them don't even pay taxes as much as they might otherwise should. And, but what they use is, so they use Amazon uses Canada Post and it ships their packages and has a special deal with Canada Post. And so they pocket all the remaining profits. Um, and yet you as an investor in the Canadian society don't realize those profits too, despite you having invested in Canadian infrastructure. And my argument here is that you, should, you too should be realizing these profits because you are an investor in uh, the, the world by your labor, uh, the, all the, your wage you produce, as well as the work nine to five, uh, five days a week that you perform. Another thing to address is, is stocks risky? Over the long term, so we're talking 10 plus years, uh, assuming that you invest, let's say, for 50 to 70 years of your life, because you wouldn't be investing necessarily when you're young, uh, there is a in the short term, stocks can be very volatile. In the long term, if, you, if you're picking large index or mutual funds, over time, they will aggregate. And when you think about the price of a stock, it is what's called the discounted rate of expected returns. That's what the price is. What that means in plain terms is if you're buying a stock and it's $30, you're assuming that over time, in the future, let's say 10 year timeline, that $30 stock might have doubled or tripled. And so when you're buying something, you're buying it at a discounted rate of what you expect the returns to be in the future. No one can predict what those expected returns will be, but 
you should, especially if you're buying mutual funds and index funds that aggregate hundreds, if not sometimes thousands of stocks all at once, you'll be able to, with confidence, predict that the economies of the world will increase. And so here's a great example of what that is. Here's the S&P 500, which is the top 500 companies by capitalization in America. If you had $100 in 1926 and you had put it in an equivalent mutual fund or index fund in 1926, today it would be worth over $1 million. Uh, Einstein famously says that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And indeed, this is what it shows you. And this is not even you continuously putting money into the stock market. This is you putting $100 in 1926 and 95 years later, it's worth a million dollars. Now, of course, uh, we all hope we'll live past 95. But this shows you uh, an interesting aggregate of over time, the stock market goes up. And if you zoom closer to around the beginning of the chart, you can see the big dip. That's the 1930s. Then you can see in the middle, that's the 1970s during stagflation. And you can see the 2000, the uh, dot-com bubble. And then 2008, you can see it go down drastically. And yet it persistently goes up over time. The S&P 500, just as a continue our example, it averages 10% a year. And that again, includes all the depressions, the multiple recessions we've seen. And you can see at the very right, there's a very slight dip and then it shoots back up and that's the COVID uh, recession. And it recovered within a record time of six months. Also to give comparison, bond yields during this entire 95 years have averaged 5%. Now, if we take the idea of inflation is 2% a year, so stocks return an average of 10%, but mine is the two. So that means 8% in real terms, at least for the S&P 500. And similarly with bond yields, if they've averaged 5% over this period of time, you minus 2%, that means the real rate of return is 3% a year. Not bad. Another mind shift you might want to start considering is that you want to separate money versus capital. And so money, first and foremost, is for buying things. So this is that money in your savings account where you're saving it for the next purchase or groceries, something fun to do, et cetera. But capital, capital is money in motion. And that's the difference between money buys commodities and products. Capital seeks out more money on its own via investments, real estate, and what have you. And so if we start thinking about the mind shifts change. If we're starting to think about money versus capital, the, the two different sort of buckets, if you will, of how to think about your wage when you receive it and what to do with it and how to allocate it, really the true cost of everything ends up being time. And so you go presumably to work, you, you do something for a certain amount of hours, you get paid every other week or once a month, and then that represents your past time. And so here I have from StatsCan once again, the average Canadian in 2019 made 49,000. I added 2% for the inflation. And so I put here the average Canadian salary per year is 50,000. And if you divide that by 40 hours per week, assuming they work 40 hours per week, five days a week, and then eight hours a week, the average Canadian makes $31.25 per hour. However, that number is deceiving because that is their gross amount. So, in other words, before taxes and other expenses, the real average Canadian wage is $22 per hour. That's minus taxes and transportation to work. Because whether you take the bus or you drive, that's um, a, a sunken cost that you have to swallow. So, okay, now we have a real number of what the average Canadian makes, which is $22 an hour. Let's break down what that actually can give you. Because we're breaking down money as capital and money is either consumed or it's turned into capital and creates more money. And that hourly wage of average $22 an hour, what can that be used? So the average Canadian rent is $1,600 approximately an hour, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a month, which comes to equivalent about 72 hours of work when you consider that the average person works 22, for $22 an hour. That means the average Ontario car insurance too is 19 $120, which is just over two weeks of working, 
when we start putting these things in perspective, we start considering, hmm, is that car worth it compared to taking the bus? Or if it is, then we can start reevaluating what kind of car we want. Just a, a more a lighthearted example, PlayStation 5 games have now increased to, with tax, $100 an hour, $100 to buy one, which would be the equivalent of four hours of work for this person at the $22 an hour wage. And something even more seems benign is a McDonald's combo. That's approximately $11, hour, $11 per combo, which would be equivalent of 30 minutes of work. And more importantly, in my estimation, is that would be the equivalent of, for the calories, 60 minutes in the gym. And then, of course, we don't know the unknown time, future time burden for potential uh, other health complications. It's just hard to see. And so I'm saying all this so that you start considering what is your time really worth? And doing this calculation for yourself of what you make minus your taxes, minus your transportation expenses, and any other uh, expenses that, that are related to working and to get your real net, how much do I work an hour? It starts allowing you the tools to completely reevaluate how do I see what, what's important in my life to buy? And secondly, what is worth my time? And so here's the sort of a, a great way I found useful to think about money in time measurements. So if you think about the wage you get, whether it's salary or otherwise, the money you receive from working, it is represents past time. You've worked two weeks or one month later, you get paid. And so that money that you get paid into your account represents past time. The present time is full of opportunity costs. And what this means is when you have, let's say $50 and you go out to a restaurant and buy something, you buy some food, that $50 is now accounted for in the opportunity cost of that $50 having been saved otherwise and making money for you or being sent to a charity or just being saved for a child's education, et cetera, et cetera. The present time is full of opportunity costs. And once you make a decision, that time or money is completely uh, accounted for. And then lastly, you can think of debt as future time. So debt is, when you think of it this way, uh, when you buy a house with a mortgage, or if you have a car with a mortgage and what have you, that mortgage is outlining the specific time allocation that has already been accounted for in your future labor. Your future labor, therefore, has been accounted for. And when you take on debt, you're saying to the debtors, that my future labor time has already been accounted for and you possess it. And so this is something to keep in mind, not saying that debt is necessarily a bad thing, but rather when you get into a, when you have that opportunity cost of what do I do with my time and therefore my money, uh, this hopefully should allow you to have more of a, you can still go out to eat. Of course, we don't want to be miserly in that sense and to save all our money and do nothing, but rather when you do make a decision, you're making one that's really informed and something that you've appreciated. And of course, with inflation rising and work just generally becoming more precarious because of COVID and otherwise, possibly you're juggling yourself multiple jobs. Uh, what's important here with investing in stocks generally and with saving and thinking about money uh, more specifically in this, these terms, you can start creating your own raise via stocks and bonds. But speaking of which, uh, this is where the library can really help you. So I told you previously that because you finance, you pay taxes, and you're financing the uh, infrastructure of the Canadian economy, and else, elsewise, because we have Amazon as an example, and even though that's an American company, they have places here in Canada. So you're helping not just Canadian economy, you're helping the world economy. And as such, and similarly, you're also a shareholder at the library because presumably, whether you live in Vaughan or not, or in our one of our close areas, you have access to Vaughan Public Libraries or whatever your local library is. And so because you pay taxes, you're a shareholder of the library too. And what's really neat about Vaughan Public Libraries is you can ask us how much money you've saved. What happens is, when you take an item out, it's added the approximate value of that item to your account. Just a little ticker 
to keep track of how much you've saved. And so I've been working for Vaughn Public Libraries for five years now, and I've saved a total of $30,000 by using my public library, which averages a $6,000 a year. That's a tremendous amount of savings. Another thing that's really interesting is the library has a cornucopia of free information, specifically for personal finance, it's in the three three twos as far as Dewey Decimal. When you go to a library, you can go to the shelves into the three three twos, and there is a, a huge assortment of not only stock books, but just general saving books, uh, learning about real estate, learning how to better yourself as far as making more money and so forth. A great, great free resource that can be a tremendous, uh, a tremendous asset for you to leverage. Again, all for free. Another thing about the library is that you should use us before you use your credit card. And what I mean is if you have children, for example, and hopefully they become uh, very enthusiastic readers, to keep up with their reading regimen might be extremely expensive. Again, I say $6,000 a year by using the library. And as such, the library is a good litmus test to use for books. We have movies video games, et cetera. And the library is a great place to take your kids, your teens and yourself and use the library resources. And then you're trying before you're buying. So maybe that movie was only worth watching once. Maybe that book didn't really do it for you. And so you've saved on that cost as a result. Another thing great about the library is, yes, you have to wait in line potentially for certain books or items. However, if you start getting used to waiting, you start getting used to profits. So similarly, when you're investing in any type of individual stock, mutual fund, index fund, or bond, it takes time for these to accrue uh, and to capitalize. It just takes time. And the library has taught me patience in that by putting lots of books on hold, even the latest releases, yes, you don't get it the immediate day sometimes. However, because I have so much on the slate to read, watch, and enjoy, by the time that new release does come to to me via hold, um, I'm always, I never think about deprivation. It's rather I'm always anticipating what's the next thing to, to enjoy. And lastly, what the library does in, in total, it, it helps me especially, and hopefully you find this too, of slowing down and appreciating the journey. We're not gonna get rich quickly. Uh, certainly that's a very a volatile way of trying, but rather the library, and uh, stocks as a whole, it takes time. And it, without appreciating the journey, we can all obsess about money endlessly, but that's money is just a means to an end. And the end is a good life with your family and friends, and then writ large with the community. And the on public libraries helps us achieve that goal, enjoying the journey. And speaking of which, I wanted to go quickly into more detail about what we have for free at the library, because people are often quite impressed with the slate of things we have. So I already, of course, we have movies and books. We have TV shows, video games now for PlayStation 5, Xbox One. We have it for Switch, music. We have eBooks and audio books that you can access from home. And similarly, we have e-newspapers, magazines, streaming movies. And a lot of these are multilingual. So you can access from whichever country you would like. Uh, all of the, a lot of these items. We also have at Vaughn Public Libraries, iPads, MyFi's, GoPros, GPS, all you can borrow for free with your library card. We also have post COVID, once we figure out the rules, we have a green room in a recording studio you can use for free with the items to utilize that area. In the green room, you can record yourself and edit videos. And in the recording studio, we have instruments or you can bring your own and record yourself. We also have hundreds of programs all year round. All of them are digital currently for all ages. This includes, of course, kid story times. We have teen book clubs and teen activities, and then stuff like this for adults. And lastly, we have lots of research databases that you can access for free at home. Consumer reports, creative bug, LinkedIn learning, which used to be uh, lynda.com. Now it's turned into LinkedIn learning academic one file, all of these are free. And one last thing, brain fuse tutoring is really neat. If you have kids or teens and they need help from two to 12 every day, the brain fuse is open so that you can access personal tutoring for free via digital 
platform, just incredible. So here you use the library to enjoy the things that you typically would want to otherwise without that financial cost or the deprivation. So let's say now, okay, you're losing money to inflation. Uh, stocks aren't as risky as you think if you think about them in the long term. And that when you reassess the way you you uh, frame your, your uh, hourly wage, you're convinced, okay, I want to start in stock market. How do I do that? Well, the first thing to do is to think about your time horizon. Now, recall that investing is the long term. That's a long term horizon, five, 10, 20 years uh, spec versus speculation is you're trying to make a quick profit in a day or a week. That's just not something we're interested in. Uh, another thing to consider before you start investing, if you haven't already, is to set goals. So, of course, setting financial goals is really important, but financial goals by themselves is an empty signifier. Instead, you want to attach those financial goals to your personal life or your family, your career and your health. Something to consider. Another thing you should be doing is you should be paying off before you invest. Pay off all your consumer debt first. And the reason is most consumer debt from credit cards, for example, they have an interest payment of 17, 20% even. And so when you pay off your consumer debt first, you're guaranteed a return on your investment, a return on paying off that debt of 17, 20% immediately. Plus the uh, stress, you're, you stop with all the stress of having that kind of consumer debt. Another thing you should try to have is an emergency fund of about three to six months of expenses on the side. That's when it's appropriate to have a savings account with some money in it. You should also set a, a generally a budget for yourself. And a lot of the books, almost all of them, as far as when it comes to finance, uh, personal finance, they all have this uh, pithy saying of paying yourself first. So if you can only afford at the moment saving 10% of your wage, then pay yourself first, pay that yourself that 10% first, and then pay your bills. But I assume once you set a budget and you start really looking at your finances, you'll be surprised how much you can cut or how much waste is there, especially when you leverage the library. And of course, lastly, you have to understand why you're doing this because money for money's sake, just it, it, ends, it never ends. And thus, you have to understand I'm investing for my financial future, for retirement, to provide for my kids, et cetera, et cetera, to help with my community. And having a clear goal uh, allows you to continue on this journey. So let's start with, you're ready, you have some money to invest, where do you actually do this? Uh, so there's three main options for Canadians and people who are living in Canada. The, the first one is the big five banks. So this is TD, BMO, Royal Bank, CIBC, Nova Scotia Bank. Uh, all of these banks allow you to individually control your investments and it's extremely convenient and there's lots of options by using one of the big five banks. Uh, however, with convenience comes costs to buy individuals, to buy anything, stocks or otherwise, it costs $9.99 on average per buying and selling. Now, as com competition, there are now digital platforms that try to beat those fees. So one of them, for example, for Canadians is Quest Trade. It's full featured and has lower fees. However, it's only digital. And another competitor that's been in the news recently is Wealthsimple. This one has little to no fees and there's no minimum deposit. However, with those low fees comes less features and two, it's only digital. So you've chosen the bank or the investment website that you're going to use. Now we're going to go into what investment vehicles you can actually put your money into. And so we're going to talk about GICs, bonds, stocks, mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs. We're not going to talk about margin, which is to say using uh, debt, cover calls, puts. We're not going to talk about crypto or NFTs either, because we want to focus on the uh, investment vehicles that the typical investor over the long term, that S&P 500 chart, really access. So before we get into it, I'm just going to take a drink of water. All right, so let's begin. So a GIC. GIC is a guaranteed investment certificate. It is really a contract between you and typically a government, uh, and it's usually bought via a bank. 
And so this is as guaranteed, as it says in the name, as any investment can be, because it's backed by, in our case, the Canadian government, just like our money is backed by the Canadian government. So as I said, that's one of the big pros of it. Um, what's also a good pro is that not only returns the capital you give them, so pretend you buy a GIC for $10,000 and it pays, we'll say, uh, 1%. After the maturity date, which is either a year or five years or 10 years, not only do you get all your capital back, that initial 10,000, but whatever interest it made. Now, the cons to GICs is that since the, about the 1980s to early 90s, they return either point, between 0.5 to 2% return. In other words, they don't even beat inflation. Also, uh, interest when you're claiming it on your tax returns is the least efficient form of a return on investment because it's 100% taxable at your marginal rate. And GICs really thrived then and during real economic depressions and during world wars. So bonds are something similar, but bonds have a, a little better track record. So a bond is, again, a contract between you and a government or a company, and you let them borrow your money and they pay you an in interest. So again, the pros is relatively safe and secure compared to uh, stocks, for example. It pays higher typically than GICs because you can buy company bonds, which again, because they're individual companies, or you can buy aggregate bonds that hold a bunch of companies and governments. Those typically pay more. What's interesting too, bonds that are on the stock market, they typically move in the opposite direction of stocks for the most part. So what that means is we'll take the COVID uh, crash in March, 2020, as an example, when stocks, the S&P 500 dropped 30%, bonds actually went up 10 to 20%. And so bonds have been used for uh, the typical investor as a great source to mitigate uh, asset risk. And as you can see, that's why they're a great part of a diversified portfolio. However, there are some cons. So the first one is that there's little capital appreciation, which means that the price of bonds really don't go up very much, especially compared to stocks. Uh, again, they pay as interest, which is the least efficient form of uh, return on investment. And historically, they just don't perform as much as stocks because they can't. You're just giving someone money to borrow and then they have to pay it back. Now stocks, which of course is the, the mainstay of the stock market. Stocks, something to keep in mind is that you actually own a company. When you buy a company, and I'm just gonna use Apple arbitrarily as an example because most people know what that is. When you buy a share of Apple, you're actually buying into ownership of the Apple company. And so you literally become a shareholder. You own a business. Now, the big pros is that capital appreciation with stocks, they, they go up more than anything else typically. And there is no limit to how high a stock can go. Uh, also, stocks, a lot of them typically can pay a dividend. And dividend is just a part of the profit, so a net profit. And they might pay either monthly or quarterly or once a year to their shareholders, which would be you. Also, stocks have intrinsic value. And what that really means is that because you're buying a stock is a, a part of a, you're buying ownership of a company. A company has intrinsic value in that it has potentially intellectual property. It might have own buildings. It has um, materials in the workplace that have value. And then lastly, the people who work there, whether it's the CEO or the custodian, everyone in the company provides intrinsic value into the company's uh, overall evaluation. And as such, stocks can be extremely lucrative as far as a investment vehicle. However, there are quite a few cons. And one of the cons is that stocks can be extremely volatile. We talked about bonds before in the previous slide, but they, they don't typically appreciate very much. Stocks can go up significantly. They can double, triple, and then they can crash. And that's famously what happened in 1929. Also, stocks are, nothing's guaranteed with stocks. You can lose money. Uh, this is 
there's something to keep in mind though. You can only lose money once you sell it. So you might buy a stock and then a day later it, it goes down, but you only realize a loss or realize a gain when you've actually sold it. So something to keep in mind. And lastly, money in one stock is one of the highest forms of risk. So we'll, again, we'll take Apple as an example. When you put, we'll say $10,000 in Apple stock, you're really counting that that one company, you're putting essentially one egg, all your eggs in one basket. And so to mitigate that risk, mutual funds were invented. The mutual fund was invented about in the 1920s in America. And the idea, hence mutual, is that a lot of people, especially retail investors like you and I, the individual investor, we might not have a lot of money and we might not be able to afford one share of Apple stock, for example. However, if we mutually combine our money into one large fund, and this one fund owns not only Apple, but various other companies, either in a sector or throughout the world, we can mutually benefit by aggregating all our money together and buying a mutual fund. And so that's the idea of a mutual fund is that not only whether the richest or the rich or the common investor can all aggregate their money and benefit together. And so another way of thinking of it is you're buying a, with a mutual fund, you're buying a basket, so to speak, of stocks or bonds and might have cash and or all three. And usually mutual funds capture a sector of the economy. And so one example could be you have a mutual fund that tackles the tech world or it's banking or just general world markets. And so mutual funds, they have all the benefits of the stock, but they can be very, very diversified, which is part of that um, the, the big negative of individual stocks. They can also, as such, mitigate lots of risk. And more importantly, they're managed for you. So you don't, you just buy one fund and maybe that fund has 500 or 100 different stocks in it, stocks, bonds, and cash equivalent. And you don't have to think about it instead of, oh, I should buy Apple and then I should buy this company A and I should buy some company B in a different sector. And that requires a lot of work and due diligence. Whereas you can buy one mutual fund and it's already done for you. And as I said, it mutually benefits the average investor because they have access to world markets, which you might not have otherwise, if you're buying, let's say through the Toronto Stock Exchange, as well as it allows multiple, you're spreading out the risks by having many, many thousands and sometimes millions of people buy one individual fund. But the cons are similar to stocks. They also can be very volatile. The price can go down and there's nothing guaranteed that they'll go up especially if it only captures one sector. So we'll say the energy sector or tech, for example. Another thing to keep in mind is that the fees for owning mutual funds can be quite, uh, quite lucrative for the fund managers. So I put here between 0.5 and 3%, which is the MER, which is the management ex manager expense ratio. Something to keep in mind, if you recall at the beginning of this, that we talked about inflation is on average 2% a year. Now, 2% seems quite benign, but as you saw, it can really add up and decay your buying power, or in the reverse, it can actually make your money really compound significantly. And so similarly, the management expense ratio, if it's 3% a year, that seems benign when you're first starting, but when you're trying to live off your investments, that could be a huge take every year. And lastly, and this might even be the most important, and that most mutual funds, the average mutual fund, the average managed fund only beats market indexes, such as the S&P 500, by about only 15% of mutual funds only beat the index. So that means 85% of mutual funds and, man and money managers can't even beat the average index. And they cost a lot. So speaking of which, what is the index fund? Well, the index fund is a type of mutual fund, but it's more managed passively. And typically there are specific indexes, but typically when we, if someone says an index fund, they're really talking about a, a broad whole market a mutual fund. So there's funds for, as I mentioned, the S&P 500, there's the NASDAQ fund, there's the TSX um, index. There's a tech index, bond indexes. It goes on and on. And so these were invented in the 1970s in America 
to counteract mutual funds because of the high management fees. So part of the pros is again, they have all the benefits of mutual funds, but they have much, much lower fees. So if mutual funds can sometimes get up to 3%, some index funds have a management fee of 0.08%. That's how low it is. That's about 30 times less than 20 to 30 times less than the average mutual fund fee. They're also very tax efficient because a lot of these depend on capital appreciation versus dividends or interest. And what's really great about them is that they're very much a buy and forget approach. When you're buying a large, a broad index fund that captures entire markets or even index funds that capture the entire world in that they own American, Canadian, Asian, African, South American, Australian, European markets all in one fund. This is really best for individual stock or individual retail investors who just want to buy something, forget about it, and in 20 to 30 years, see their money have gone up significantly. Now, the cons to, mutual, to index funds is, again, in the previous slide, I said that 85% of fund managers can't beat the index. However, there are 15% who do beat the index. There's been a lot of studies about the metadata over a long period of time, we're talking 20, 30 years of those active managers being indexed, that number becomes significantly less than 15%. But on average per year, about 15% of active managers can still beat these index funds. And something to keep in mind when you're buying an index fund is you want to make sure that it's truly diversified because some of the diverse diversification claims for index funds can be very deceiving. As an example, if you're buying a tech index, you're thinking, well, oh, it must be, it could be hundreds of, hundreds of stocks and they're all within the tech industry and they, it must be very diversified. However, you have to always do your due diligence and look into how many stocks does it hold? Is it all in the same sector? And if it is, is it all in the same country? And then is it all in the same type of tech sector as an example? Index funds, however, in the last about 20 years have really become much, much more popular for the average investor. And so speaking of which, to make it even more accessible, I talked about mutual funds and index funds. And previously, you would have to actually sign up with a, either a bank and they would do it for you, or you would have to sign up with the investment firm. So some examples are Vanguard or BlackRock, and you would buy their mutual funds or index funds through them. However, with the rise of the individual investor and to make it more accessible to the public writ large, what's been created is called ETF or exchange traded funds. So these are mutual funds, index funds, but you can have access to them via the Toronto Stock Index, or sorry, the Toronto Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ Exchange. And that's what the E stands for in exchange traded funds is that you as a personal person can access these index funds, mutual funds in their ETF forms. So you don't have to sign up for, with those big companies and buy through them. You can just do it on your own. So that's great. As you can see, it's bought through major exchanges. And this is really great for the self-directed individual investor because it gives you complete control over what you're buying and selling at any time that the stock markets are open. But the cons are similar to the cons of index funds and mutual funds. They can go up and down. They can be volatile. There's nothing guaranteed. So something to keep in mind. All right, so you've decided, okay, I'm going to buy some maybe individual stocks, mutual funds, and some bonds, but what are the actual accounts that I hold these investments in? And so we're going to talk about them now. The first one, and if you're 18 or older, you should absolutely have one of these, is the TFSA, or the Tax-Free Savings Account. But it has a misnomer title. Specifically, it has a title as tax-free, it should be really tax-free investment account. A lot of Canadians, there's been a recent survey Global Mail had, over 50% of Canadians have just money sitting in their tax-free savings account. And if you've learned anything from having it in a savings account, your money loses 2% on average from inflation. It's buying power. The tax-free savings account should really be your investment account because everything in that account, whether it's interest or dividends, distributions, you make capital gains, or even return on investment, all of that is completely tax-free. So you put that money, you get your wage, the tax is taken off, and what is left, the net income that you have, that is what you can put in a tax-free savings account. 
And so this was introduced in 2009 to Canadians and permanent residents who are 18 and older. Um, and this was one of the, another strategy that the government is using in order to encourage the average Canadian to save money. And so pretend that you're uh, in your 30s, 40s or older, that means you have a cumulative total as of 2021 of $75,500. What that means is that you can specifically deposit up to $75,500 and that money in your tax-free savings account, you can buy stocks, mutual funds, bonds, index funds, and all of it grows tax-free. And then there is no limit to how much it can grow. Something to keep in mind though, is that you should not ever over contribute or you'll have to pay 1% fee every month. So make sure you're never over that 75,500 and every year it increases. You can see recently it's been increasing by $6,000. And another thing to keep in mind is that if for some reason you have to take out money and your account has actually grown, when you take out money, you can't put money back in until the following calendar year, January the 1st. So for example, let's say you bought a stock and it went up $6,000 and you had put $75,500, your new total would be $81,500, but you need that $6,000 for some reason. So you take it out, you can't put $6,000 again, until the following year. But then come January 1st of the following year, not only could you put that $6,000 back in, but whatever the new limit is, you can also put that in too. So this is an incredible tool for everyone to use. Every single person listening to this should have a tax-free savings account. And you should be buying stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or index funds according to what you think favorably in there. Another thing the government has created is the RRSP, or the Registered Retirement Savings Plan. This was invented in 1957 because the government realized the, pen, the typical CPP pension um, wasn't enough to sustain most people, even if they had a pension too. So they create this uh, investment account, which again, it has a misnomer title. It should really be called the Registered Retirement Investment Plan, not Savings Plan, because all the money in these accounts, it accrues tax deferred. And so I'll get into that in a little moment. Uh, but you can contribute about 18% of last year's earnings up to a limit of right now, approximately in 2021 is around 20, just under $28,000. Uh, but importantly, if you have a pension, that will decrease and they, that calculation is automatically done for you. Now, here's the key thing. It, because it's tax deferred money, when you deposit money, you'll get a refund because it's taken as pre-tax money. So we'll pretend as an example that you make $50,000 a year and you were able to put $5,000 into your RRSP. When tax time comes, you'll be able to claim 5,000, making 5,000 less. So on your taxes, it will only show that you made $45,000 and you'll get a slight refund on that, which is very, very powerful. So not only do you get immediate return on investment, if you like to think about it that way, on whatever you put in your RRSP, but then the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and index funds that you have in your RRSP also grow tax-free, tax-deferred. Now they get, they do get taxed once you actually take them out. And that will be taken, that will be taxed at your marginal rate when you retire, presumably. And if earlier, if you really need the money earlier, there are tax penalties. So I wouldn't suggest using it for that. When you put money in your RRSP, you should really leave it alone. There are two exceptions, two big exceptions. One of them is for first time home buyer. And there's also exceptions for educational reasons if you're going to school, but you have to put money, that money back in eventually. So the RRSP is a really fantastic tool that we should all have an account. Then there's the non-registered cash account. So in other words, if you've maxed out your tax free and you've maxed out your RRSP, you should open just what's called a non-registered account. And it has slightly different names depending on where, what institution you use. But in other words, this account, all the capital gains, the dividends, interests, all of that is, will be taxed at the end of the year at your marginal rate. However, there are some strategies of um, reducing taxes. For example, if you hold tax efficient assets, we talked about index funds and 
are one form of tax efficient asset. Um, if you have capital losses, those become write-offs to a, to a certain amount per year and can be carried over. So as an example, if you bought a stock and it just wasn't doing well and you sold it, you can claim on your taxes a capital loss, which will bring down your total taxable account amount that year. And also something to keep in mind that I briefly mentioned, you only pay from actually realizing gain. So if you don't sell a stock mutual fund or index fund, you don't actually pay it. So it can keep going up and up year after year and year after year, accrue lots and lots of money, but you don't actually pay until you sell it because then it becomes a taxable event. There are a couple other types of accounts that are available to you. Uh, one of them is the Registered Education Savings Plan, the RESP, and this is for saving for a child. And this can be contrib contributed to up to $50,000 over the lifetime. And the government matches the first 20% for every year of the first 2,500. So that's about 500 a year, but only up to 7,200 currently. That might increase over time, but that's at the rate right now. Again, just like the RRSP, this money grows tax-free, or should I say tax-deferred, because when you actually withdraw it, it has it gets taxed at the marginal rate for that person. And presumably it would be fairly low because they would be a student. There's also the registered retirement income fund. And that's when your RRSP actually converts to a RIF. And that's obligated when you're 70, currently with the rules in place, when you're 71 years old. However, you can convert it earlier. And then every year at a certain age, you're actually obligated to withdraw a certain percentage. There's also the register, there's also an RDSP, which is a registered disabled savings plan. There's also other ones called locked in accounts, and those are usually through your pension plan. But the three main one for most investors is the R, the tax free savings account, the RRFP, the non registered cash account. And then if you have a child, you should definitely open the RESP. Now, here is an important strategy or a important topic within the investment community is, okay, you've decided you're investing in stocks, bonds, and what have you. You're ready to go. You're starting to buy, but how much do I buy and what do I buy of? And this is a quite a controversial science because if you haven't noticed in total that investing is not so much about money per se, but it's truly a psychological endeavor. Is It's one thing to buy a stock see it go up and think you're a genius. And it's another to buy a stock and it starts going down and it starts playing with your mind to see red. And as such, the past results don't necessarily guarantee future outcome over the short term, over the long term, if you're buying large over the stock market as a whole goes up. And so you want to then associate what you're buying uh, accordingly. And that really comes down to, therefore, your risk tolerance. Are you okay with more risk and you just want a higher return over time? Then maybe buying individual stocks is your go-to. Or maybe you just want to hit that average, which beat, again, the average beats 85% of most um, investors. Maybe you just want that. Or maybe you want to add lots of bonds because you're getting close to retirement and you want a consistent income. And so this ratio between stocks and bonds and mutual funds and index funds is really, it all comes according to ultimately your risk tolerance, even though some of the, the mathematical literature has specific allocations. Um, this is all outlined in the books list that I've created for you to do further investigation. And again, let's pretend you are extremely risk tolerant. I can stomach risk. I just want the highest possible return. Well, even then you get conversations of, do you buy growth stocks, which are blue chip companies, those large Apple, Amazon, uh, the bank, the Canadian banks type companies, or you are more a value stock. So big companies that have hit recent turbulence and that there's some value because there's in, their intrinsic value is below the market value. Or the you want more dividend stocks because you want a guaranteed income monthly or quarterly. And so this is something as you figure out your risk tolerance, what will work best for you. And then lastly is for allocation strategies, you have to think about goals 
over time. Because if you don't have an overall macro idea of why you're doing this in the first place, you might pick things out of whim. And so instead, is this something, is this account, for example, when you're deciding how what to buy and what uh, ratio to buy it in? Is this because this is for a child's university? And so you have 18 years to save up. Maybe you want to buy something that's less risky, but that grows over time versus this is retirement, but I'm not using it for years and years. So on Vaughn Public Library's website, I've created a book list and it's called Investing in Stocks for Everyone. Everyone will be emailed this. And if you would like the link, I will provide my email in the next slide. So you can email me and ask for the link to that. I've already talked about the personal finance section in all libraries, but especially Vaughn Public Libraries is 332s. Um, there's also the, if you want more stock market specifics, information on individual stocks or mutual funds or index funds or bonds, you can go to Yahoo Finance or the Toronto TMX website, which is Toronto Stock Exchange. Those two, all the information there is completely free. Two podcasts that I would really highly suggest you listen to. Both of them, The Rational Reminder, are done by, it's, everything is free, of course. They are two CPAs who live in Ottawa, and they have a absolutely terrific podcasts, weekly podcasts. They have lots of guests, professors, they have bankers, they have uh, entrepreneurs, and they really break down not just investing, but they talk about happiness and money. They talk about, is it worth buying a house versus renting? They go into anything that has to do with financial health and financial literacy, they tackle. And similarly, The Plain Bagel is a YouTube channel that is run by a, again, coincidentally, an Ottawa CPA. And he has really pithy 10, 15 minute videos on topics. So he'll talk about margin calls and puts. He'll talk about how stock markets work and break down complicated ideas and break it down into a very digestible format. And then lastly, there's also the CPA. You, you'll want to go to the CPA Canada Financial Literacy Resources. They have a ton of stuff for all ages uh, free resources for you to dig into. So once again, if you want a list for that, all of that is in, uh, you can email me at lonnie.friedman at vaughn.ca and I'll send you all those links. Um, it's already passed by the time you're hearing this, the teacher kids and teens about money. That presentation has already passed. However, if you're presumably watching this on our Vaughn Public Library YouTube page, that presentation would also be on the YouTube page. And so I hope I've inspired you to take charge of your finances with a little more confidence. I know that this is a lot of information. Let it wash over you. You can replay certain sections, but what the key thing is, is that you truly can take control over your life direction. And money is not as scary as you might initially think. And in fact, it's quite empowering when you start thinking of it as, again, as time allocation. And if you start thinking in long-term, stock market is a great place to put some of your money. I hope this presentation, once again, was fruitful. Please email me if you have any questions, not only about uh, the resources I talked about, but just about the library in general. And I hope, and good luck with investing in the stock market.